and welcome back to Slated for More. Today we are going to talk about equipment and tools for the Photographer Toolkit. Now this is a toolkit that is intended for the entry level person, not someone of Darren's <laughs> stature. Um, so what would you recommend someone just starting out first camera? What recommendations do you have? You know, find one that has detachable lenses. Uh, I'm not going to get into the Canon Nikon debate. <laughs> They're both great. Honestly, I think Sony has some great uh, options as well. And you know, that's, that's actually what this is being shot on right now. Yes. Um, so right now I'm shooting with a Nikon and a Sony body, which they both bring different things to the table. Uh, right now, I really love the Sony for portraits. Mm -hmm. uh, the Nikon is great for my studio work. Mm -hmm. uh, but as far as entry level, I mean, you can honestly get, you know, the kit lens, which I want to say it's still the 18 to 55. Even if you've got the nifty 50, mm -hmm. 51, 8 is lens. Is that on the 18 to 55 is on which camera? That, oh, sorry. That was in the Canon. Okay. Um, I don't know if Nikon has. They usually have some sort of kit lens that comes with it. I started out on a Nikon, um, and it did have a kit lens. I don't remember. It was something similar to yeah. that. But just get started. I mean, the thing is, with the kit lenses, most likely the reason why they're cheap is because it's not glass. It's plastic inside there. So your images will be just a tad soft, but you can still uh, produce quality work. Uh, the whole point is just produce the quality work and just keep shooting every day. Um, so if you were to step up one step up from a kit lens, would you go to a prime lens? Yes. And what would you do first? A 50, what? 35? 50 is good. Now keep in mind, I don't know if you're buying a camera that is crop censored or full, uh, full frame. Mm -hmm. um, so if you are shooting, say a crop sensor, typically that's a one fifth, uh, ratio and you're actually shooting with a 70 to 75 millimeter lens I, without doing the math right. I don't know. Uh, on a full frame your 50 is a 50 and that's really the difference between that uh, I love full frame I probably won't go back to crop censored but it is what it is well and I think most of the less expensive cameras are the crop they are it's because it's a smaller sensor it's cheaper to make and it has allowed a lot more people to jump into photography. And how do you know if it's a, a glass lens? <laughs> Research online. You just have to look it up. You have to look okay. it up. You have to look at the specs. Um, they're not going to openly tell you, hey, this is made with plastic. Right. They just want you to buy it. Right. You know, so it's not in the camera, uh, camera maker's best interest to let you know that it's made with plastic. Okay. And then once you have the camera and the lens, I think something people tend to forget about is there actually is a difference in some of the SD cards that come with it mm -hmm. or that you can buy. Yep. So you actually need to get like a pro or do you, do you know off the top of your head what those I'm a fan are? of SanDisk Ex Extreme. Okay. Um, that's the one thing I don't mess around with is spend good money on a good SD card. Yeah, you might find a Black Friday deal for five bucks. You're putting people's pictures on the card and right. hoping it doesn't crash. Um, there was a point where also look to make sure it has um, a serial number on the card as well. Your uh, not your knockoffs don't, but they're trying to get everybody to purchase you know SD cards. Just do yourself a favor. You got to realize you're you've got family memories. You're shooting weddings. You're putting images right. on this card. Don't mess around. Get a good one. I mean, whether there's no way to really like have backup, like it's on that SD card and right. that's it. Um, do you have any recommendation? I've heard some debate on you should um, always put the SD card. Um, let's see. You should always connect the camera to the computer and... Um, get the files from the computer that way, or maybe you should reformat after every time you take them off instead of deleting. Like, yeah. what are your recommendations there? I will say never connect your camera unless you have no other options, but even then, never move, always copy. 
So what I always do is I've got a little card reader. I take that, I take the card out, put it in my card reader, and I actually copy these files into a folder on my computer. Once I know it's there, I verify if there's 55 uh, images on this card. I look to see there's, there's 55. I still place it off to the side. I still haven't deleted it or uh, reformatted it yet. I've, I keep a series of at least eight SD cards and I rotate through them. Uh, once it's on my computer, I then also make a backup to another hard drive. So I've got two copies of this. Right. Always, always, always back up as much as possible. And honestly, what I like about some of these cameras today, there are two card slots. As, I mean, technology oh. is getting better. Yeah. Where I've got one card slot that has my raw files. I have the second card slot has JPEG files just in case something happens. Mm -hmm. I'm always going to work with my raw files uh, because I get all the dynamic range. I get everything um, in the photo that I want versus a JPEG where things have been stripped away to make the files smaller. I want everything. Give me it all. Right. So... I'm, but then once you have it off onto your computer, how are you deleting the files off the SD card? Once I'm ready to go, before I go to a shoot and I put that card in, I look to see what is on that card. And then I'm, and I'm like, okay, I have downloaded these. Then I will format. I will okay. always format before a shoot. So you don't delete, you reformat. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. And I, never and I never delete from the computer. It's always via the camera. The camera. Because also... Say I'm shooting with, I have a second shooter, and let's just say, because I'm Nikon, she's got Canon. I will know that when I put that in my camera, my camera cannot read those files because it's another language. Yes. So if I question it, then I go back, I put it in the card reader, double check to see what's on that, and then go, okay, cool. I still need to format it to my body, which is Nikon or happens to be Sony. I completely killed... Um a very large SD card that I had because of that. It had been in my Nikon. I put it in my Sony, did not. I think I, I can't remember if I reformatted it or not, but I, I shot on it and then, and lost like client images, lost personal images for my son's birthday. It was awful. And I even, I reformatted it after that, used it again, it still had issues with the SD card after that. So I just threw it away because mm -hmm. I couldn't even trust it at that point. Yep. And they're too expensive to not treat properly. Right. Um, so after the SD card, um, I'm assuming maybe a tripod is next or... I like a tripod. It's... To me, it's just what makes you a better photographer. If you're doing headshots, I like to use a tripod in the studio. Mm -hmm. You know, it just makes me steady. It makes me solid because these people are trusting me to uh, get a sharp image of them for their business cards, for their website. And I think it's it's not hard to use. Mm -hmm. uh, if, you, if you're the nature photography, uh, maybe you need to do a long exposure. Yes, a tripod is an amazing piece to have because you can't handhold anything for six seconds. Right. No one can. Um, what else is in your camera bag? Well, maybe the camera bag itself. <laughs> Oof. Um, I I have triggers for my studio strobes. I have a light meter, a Seconic 358 light meter that I can measure the light source. Um, so I understand uh, what I need to set my camera to in when I'm in a studio setting. It also comes in handy when I'm shooting weddings and I've got a studio strobe in the middle of the aisle so I can take family photos from that 30 foot distance. What is my light? What, how much, you know, how much, uh, what should I set my camera to? Mm -hmm. uh, so it's been a great piece to have. Um, I have a series of lenses, all, you know, different kinds based on what do I need to do? Um, from primes to zoom lenses, you know, ba a basic uh, setup is, or what you can get if, if you can afford it, is like a 24 to 70 millimeter lens. Canon has it, Nikon has it. I believe Sony now has it as well. But uh, another one is a, is a telephoto, like a 70 to 200. Mm -hmm. um, you can get some really cool stuff. And in fact, when I started out, the guy said, if you can swing it by the 70 to 200 millimeter lens, uh, 2.8, 
That'll be your bread and butter lens. So hmm. doing portraits, like say seniors, I was able to just blur out that background where people go, how do you do that blurry background thingy? Right. Cool. That's how you did it. And mm -hmm. you got sharp images because in Canon, that little red ring around uh, the 70 to 200, the 24 to 70 is an L lens. And that's a uh, their upper, sharper uh, lens line. Lenses make a huge difference. Lenses make a huge difference. They really do. I discovered this back in the Canon days. We had a 24 to 70 and I had a 20 to 135. We both went out and shot an engagement session mm -hmm. and came back to the computer. My images were soft and not like blurry, but you could just tell it was just right. a little bit. And I was like, huh, had no idea. So whatever, whatever glass is in that 28 to 135 is not as good as the glass in the 24 to 70. Right. So after that, I was like, L series only. Right. Unless I'm buying a prime. Right. Um, okay. So camera, SD card, tripod, um, for a start, someone starting off, they're probably not going to have a studio starting off. At, in, but you can get probably. a, you can get a flash. True. Um, okay. So what kind of flash? Uh, Nikon has the SB900, Canon has. Uh, Is that something that attaches to the top of the camera? Yep, or? so there's a hot shoe, uh -huh. and that hot shoe, what's nice about the hot shoe is the camera um, can actually uh, tell the flash in TTL mode, not to get, it's called through the lens, uh, how much flash to put out. Mm -hmm. So what the camera does in TTL mode is, it as it's looking through the lens, it says, okay, here's the exposure, Here's how much light I'm going to put out based on that exposure. So it doesn't blow out your subject. It doesn't underexpose your subject. That's great. Unless you want to manipulate that because there's always that as well. You can go in manual mode, but then you have to figure out, well, how much light do I need to put out? Is it one eighth power, full power, you know, things like that. Right. So there's a little bit more work, but all of it is just, it's, it's no different than cooking. It's, you know, how much salt do you add to this dish? How much garlic do you add to this right. dish? And just find the right recipe that this looks good. This tastes good in a sense that that mentality is technically the same. So even though you, if you start with a flash on top of your camera, most likely most people point it straight at the person. It's a nice effect, but you get that deer in the headlights, that car lights look. Mm -hmm. It's a little too direct. What I like to do is point it up and bounce it and get a softer light. Uh, feathering light is definitely a technique that anyone should learn. It's not hard. Bottom line is understand light. It's all direction. And how much of it, you know, how much of that quality of light are you actually putting onto the person that you're photographing? Third part to your flash is can you get it off the hot shoe? Right. So... That takes it off, you know, this side or this side. So you start creating shadows. Um, technically, it's a little trickier. It's not hard to learn. Uh, just find the right mentor. Go to. I took three workshops for me to get it because it was pretty in depth. And again, once I got it, you know, to me, it's tools in a toolbox. You know, mm -hmm. how much marketable am I because of my knowledge? Okay, so beyond. Kind of, I, does that cover basics of what would be in a starter's camera bag? It does. It's pretty in-depth. I mean, you don't need the light meter. You probably don't need, I mean, basically your camera, your SD card, make sure you got a good battery or backup battery. Oh, yes. That's definitely, I have three batteries just for this one camera. <laughs> that's why you need the new Sony because the battery is amazing. Okay, I, I, I can well. shoot a whole wedding and I'm at 50%. Okay, well, there you go. Um, so beyond that, in the camera bag, what else do you need to actually start and run your business outside of just camera equipment? Well, it, it's understanding what is it that you want to shoot. You know, if you're in dark scenarios, so like, say for me, I'm in, you know, reception halls, you know, with weddings, it's pretty dark. I need to figure out how can I manipulate this light? And that's most likely I will need a tripod. Mm -hmm. uh, or fat or better. What about reflectors or? Mm -hmm. is If you're in a dark place, a reflector doesn't work. True. But if you're outside, you're in a park and you don't want to do um, flash. Yes, reflectors are great. And you don't have to buy super expensive. Only problem is you might have to get somebody to stand there and hold it for you. Actually, <laughs> what you can do is, and you can find 
you know, cheap tri- uh, light stands these days. And you can go to Office Depot, buy a two by three sheet of foam core, clamp it mm-hmm. onto your tripod. Again, but remember on reflecting, you're reflecting light. It's almost, I, I jokingly say, it's almost like you're burning ants. So you remember when you burned ants, you had to get that light just right, right you know, to hit the ant hole. It's the same thing with reflecting light. You actually have to hold the light. So if your light source is right here, it's a, it, and maybe it's another analogy is like playing pool. It's all angles. angles. So if I want, if my light source is right here and I want it here, I have to hold it at 45 degrees or something like that. You'll see that. You'll see where the light shines on their face. Cool. Once you find that, stop and have your mom or whoever's holding that <laughs> do that. But you can totally do this yourself. I've seen there's some handheld um, reflectors as well. There's a triangular one that's actually pretty cool. I thought about buying, but I don't use reflectors that much right. anymore. Um, what about tools just to run the business? Like, do you have accounting software you use? Like, what kind of editing software do you use? I use Lightroom. I also use Capture One and I use Photoshop. Okay. So I don't rely on Photoshop other than to polish a photo. I feel it does uh, a better job at uh, fixing skin blemishes, uh, maybe the bags under the eye, sharpen the eye just a tad. And some of these things you can do in Lightroom, I'm just more comfortable in mm-hmm. Photoshop with that. You can get by with Lightroom and Photoshop. Actually, the photographer's bundle is stupid yes. cheap. It's like 10 bucks a month. And I know there's some photographers out there still fighting it, still holding on to the last piece of, I want to own Photoshop. Please do yourself a favor because you're constantly getting an update of the newest software. I mean, what mm-hmm. the liquify filter in Photoshop is amazing now compared to even three years ago. Because if I want to adjust your eye, it's a slider now. Used to, right. used to I have to like move around and get and try to get it right now. I'm just like, uh, uh, and I'm done. Right. Uh, and what was the other? You said Capture One. Capture One what is, that? is so phase. Phase one is a medium body or medium format camera that high-end photographers use. Okay. They created um, an editing software for that camera, but it's available for anybody. Nikon, Canon, Sony oh. can also, because it's just basically, it's like Lightroom. It's editing software. Okay. It renders files just a little different than Lightroom. There, every now and then I'll find a photo will look what I call muddy. I can't 100% tell you what that means because it's not necessarily noisy, but it's missing something. And if I feel that it's just not handling this file correctly, I'll move it over to Capture One and edit it over there where I just feel I get a cleaner look. I'm not as fluent with Capture One, so I don't use it 100% for workflow. Lightroom is great for workflow, especially with weddings when you're trying to organize first look to the ceremony, to the details, you know, things of that nature. And I, and I will always use Lightroom for that aspect. Mm-hmm. But Capture One, it wasn't until I went to a workshop in Dallas, he was using that. And mm-hmm. I was like, wow, that's amazing. Right. So I purchased it. And it's, just, again, another tool in my toolbox um, that I just feel sometimes it does a better job at something. What do you think you need computer-wise? Um, you can do it on a laptop. Um as far as Lightroom and Photoshop, it just, it comes to processing speed and do you have patience when it's slow? Mm-hmm. Uh, I know there's Lightroom Cloud, which I'm not fluent with yet, but the way I understand it, and I know there's a couple girls that uh, that are photographers and I'll see their photos online and they're sitting with their iPads and editing photos, like, you know, sitting on the couch and I'm like, on the couch. And I'm like, that's pretty cool, but I don't know how to manipulate that into what I do. Right. So, I mean, if that's a way, if you only have like, you know, a decent iPad, you can edit your photos that way as well. My experience with the Lightroom Cloud, I've just barely, very basically started working with it a little bit, um, is that it doesn't have as many options as classic right. Lightroom. So I thought, oh, this is great. I'll transition over to that. And then as soon as I tried to do what I'm used to doing, I was like, okay, never mind. I'm going back to classic. <laughs> yeah. I I'm not there yet. And maybe someday. Right. Um, so what about 
um, like I mentioned, the accounting software. Do you use an accounting software? Like, how do you invoice clients, receive payment? So I have, um, I do use QuickBooks, but as far as a invoicing system, and this is something I found a while back, and there's, I think there's multiple websites out there, but this one's called Hivage. H i v e a g e. Okay. Um, I pay to have it, but basically, I can invoice a client, and I can see if they viewed it. Um, and they could just send me a check if they want to pay, say by PayPal or Square. Um, I can set up another way that way as well. So I have that on. I have Square and PayPal on my phone. Uh, I can swipe a credit card mm -hmm. if I'm on location, which is basically a lot of what I do. Mm -hmm. If uh, say someone want, wants to make a, a payment, uh, they either want to meet me in person, mail me a check, or I can send send them a PayPal request or a Square request and they can pay that one. And then how do you deliver, like I always, when I get my family portraits done, I always want digital copies. So how do you, do you do galleries to show them first and then they pick from it or, and then how do you deliver those files to them? Actually, I use Pixie Set okay. to, for them to download. I mean, basically I used to let them, you know, pick their favorite photos and then only have those. And I got to thinking, I'm like, there's a lot of great photos being left on the table. So I just, I create a gallery. It, they'll know up ahead of time, you know, basically how many are they expecting? You know, say if they have the middle package, I'll tell them, you know, you'll get about 25 to 30 images. Most likely you'll get more than that. Okay. But let's just say I decided to give you 50 because we had a lot of fun on the photo shoot. Mm -hmm. I'll upload those to Pixie Set. You'll have a code to download those. And those are large files that you can have then on your computer. You'll also have a print release. So if you need to go to your favorite lab, uh, it basically just hands everything over to you. Mm -hmm. So it's a way for them to download their files. I mean, anything cloud-based. If it's something where it's really large, like a bunch of raw files, not Dropbox, but Box. I've been using that quite okay. a bit. The thing is with Pixie Set and Box is I don't pay for those. There is a level that you can, but I keep everything low. So I only keep like maybe three sets of photos or three... Yeah, three sets of client photos at a time in Pixie Set. I tell them you've had two weeks to download these, and then boom. and then they're coming off. They're coming off. Okay. Same thing in Box. You've got two weeks to download these, which two weeks is God's plenty of time to download the photos and then take it out. Right now, the thing is, they're still on my computer. It does happen. They go, "Oh my God, life got busy. Something happened. I haven't downloaded them." I'm not that photographer. Who says, "Okay, for another twenty five bucks, you know, I'll put right. it back up." I'm like, "Don't do that. It's." Horrible business. Right. Just upload it. Just tell them the look. Same thing. You've got two weeks to download it, and then pull it down in two weeks. Um. And what about um? You said their favorite lab. Do you have like when they say where should I go get this printed? What are your recommendations? Uh, something to start with is MPix. Okay. MPix dot com. They're out of Pittsburgh, I've, Kansas. I've used them. Yeah. I actually like to use uh, Pro DPI. Okay. And uh, White House Color. White House Color, WHCC. Um, and I actually think Pro DPI bought White House. But either way, it's coming out of Minnesota. Um, <laughs> I like the color better. Um, if you look at any any of or most of my work, I love color. You know, whether it's saturation or just, you know, just color. I feel they do just a little bit better of, of a job at color. Mm -hmm. But find your lab. I mean, order test prints. Take and, you know, upload a just a photo and have, you know, a four by six printed and go to several different labs and find that, you know, go, oh, I like this, you know, find your lab. Not because I tell you to go to Empix. It's just, it's an easy, it's a, it's an easy one that everybody knows about and they're good. I have nothing against them, but find what makes, you know, makes, makes it work for you, I guess. So are there any other software that you would recommend someone get starting out? Those are the basics. I mean, really, you can do so much manipulation. Um, and again, you can or, you can order presets or purchase presets uh, for Lightroom. You can purchase actions for uh, Photoshop. But honestly, I don't see people talking about actions anymore. No, I haven't. It's either. more just it's a preset, and a lot of these, you know, looks like film are actually they. You can either have it for Lightroom or uh, Adobe Camera Raw. Uh, you can go either way, depending on what is your workflow. Okay. All right. So 
Get your camera, get your lens, get your lighting and your tripod, get your editing software, and a way to deliver the images to the client, and you're pretty much set. Yep, well, website and pricing. Website, yes. Uh, do you have a preference on website builder? Nope. Um, nope, not at all. Just find one that works with you. You can always make adjustments to it. And, and a professional email address. Yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's about it. Yeah, so go to GoDaddy, buy your domain. Uh, make sure you have, like, see for mine, it's Darren at DarrenHackney.com. Mm -hmm. um, it looks better than something Darren, Darren at... Hackney Photography at Gmail. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, I will put links to everything that we have recommended. Um, all the tools and equipment will be listed on the blog. Um, there will be a link to the blog post under this video. And I will also include links to all of Darren's <laughs> connections so you can connect with him and come visit the poorhouse as well. Yes. So thank you very much for being on my channel. Thank you. Bye.